today I'm going to discuss about Rogers Person Center Theory. So in this report, I'm going to tackle about the overview of Client Center Theory, the biography of Carl Rogers, and the Person Center Theory. So overview of Client Center Theory. Carl Rogers is best known as the founder of Client Center Theory. So he was more of a therapist than a theorist. He developed a humanistic theory of personality that grew out of his experiences as a practicing psychotherapist. He was more concerned with helping people than with discovering why they behaved as they did. So he was more likely to ask, how can I help this person grow and develop? Then to ponder question, what caused this person to develop in this manner? So Rogers built his theory on the scaffolding provided by experiences as a therapist. He continually called for empirical research to support both his personality theory and his therapeutic approach. His personal preference was to be a helper of people and not a constructor of theories. So during the 1950s, Rogers was invited to write what was then called the client-centered theory of personality. Biography of Carl Rogers Carl Ransom Rogers was born on January 8, 1902 in Oak Park, Illinois, fourth of the six children to Walter and Julia Cushing Rogers. So Rogers had intended to become a farmer and he entered the University of Wisconsin as an agriculture major. Soon, he became less interested in farming and more devoted to religion. So in 1924, he entered the Union Theological Seminary with the intention of becoming a minister. While at the seminary, he enrolled in several psychology and education courses at neighboring Columbia University. He was influenced by the progressive education movement of John Dewey. He became disenchanted with the doctrinaire attitude of religious work and left the seminary to attend teacher's college on a full-time basis with a major in clinical and educational psychology in 1926. In 1927, Roger served as a fellow at the New Institute for Child Guidance in New York City and continued to work there while completing his doctoral degree. Rogers received a PhD from Columbia in 1931 after having already moved to New York to work with the Rochester Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. He had harbored a desire to teach in a university after a rewarding experience during the summer in, of 1935 at Teachers College and after having taught courses in sociology at the University of Rochester. Pressed by his graduate students at Ohio State, Rogers gradually conceptualized his own ideas on psychotherapy. These ideas put forth in counseling and psychotherapy published in 1942. His therapy evolved from one that emphasized methodology, or what in the early 1940s was called the non-directed technique, to one which was the sole emphasis was on the process and effectiveness of psychotherapy. Rogers, along about with about 75 others from Western Behavioral Sciences Institute, formed the Center for Studies of the Person. He was the first president of the American Association for Applied Psychology and helped bring that organization and the American Psychology Association back together. He served as president of APA for the year 1946 to 1947 and served as the first president of the American Academy of Psychotherapists. In 1956, he was the co-winner of the first Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award presented by APA. Rogers originally saw little need for a theory of personality, but under pressure from others and also to satisfy an inner need to be able to explain the phenomena he was observing, he evolved his own theory. Person-Centered Theory So under this theory are the basic assumptions, the self and self-actualization, Awareness, becoming a person, and barriers to psychological health. Person-centered theory. 
Although Rogers' concept of humanity remained basically unchanged from the early 1940s until his death in 1987, his therapy and theory underwent several changes in name. During the early years, his approach was known as non-directive. Later, his approach was variously termed client-centered and person-to-person. Client-centered is used in reference to Rogers' therapy, while the person-centered is used to refer to Rogerian personality theory. In Chapter 1, we said that clearly formulated theories are often instated in an if-then framework, so Rogers' person-centered theory comes closest to meeting these standards. If certain conditions exist, then the process will occur. If this process occurs, then certain outcomes can be expected. Basic Assumptions Rogers postulated two broad assumptions, the formative tendency and the actualizing tendency. Formative Tendency Rogers believed that there is a tendency for all matter, both organic and inorganic, to evolve from simpler to more complex forms. So for example, is the complex galaxies of stars formed from a less well-organized mass. A crystal such as snowflakes emerge from formless vapor. Complex organisms develop from single cell. And human consciousness evolves from a primitive unconsciousness to a highly organized awareness. For the entire universe, a creative process, rather than it is integrative one, is an operation. Actualizing Tendency the tendency within all humans and other animals to move toward completion or fulfillment of potentials. This tendency is the only motive people possess. The need to satisfy one's hunger drive, to express deep emotions when they are felt, and to accept oneself are all examples of the single motive of actualization. So tendencies to maintain and to enhance the organism are subsumed within the actualizing tendency. Maintenance. It includes such basic needs as food, air, and safety, but it also includes the tendency to resist change and to seek the status quo. The need for maintenance is similar to the lower steps on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The conservative nature of maintenance needs is expressed in people's desire to protect their current comfortable self-concept because they find change painful and growth frightening. Enhancement. This need to become more, to develop, and to achieve growth is called enhancement. The need for enhancing the self is seen in people's willingness to learn things that are not immediately rewarding. Bisan pa, gusto rin nila magstay sa ilang current self-concept kay comfortable na sa dito, they are still willing to learn and to change. So example, what motivates a child to walk? Na okay naman na magkamang lang siya kay makaadto na maghihapon siya sa iyang atuan, bisa dili siya maglakaw. Whereas kung maglakaw siya kay nai tendency nga matumba siya. So kung matumba siya kay masakit ang judge siya. So it's because people are willing to face threat and pain because of a biologically based tendency for the organism to fulfill its, ba- its basic nature. The actualization tendency is not limited to humans. Other animals and even plants have an inherent tendency to grow toward reaching their genetic potential provided certain conditions are present. So for example, for a plant to reach its full productive potential, kailangan niya og water, sunlight, og nutrient soil. My conditions pag umreach ang ilang full productive potential. So the same as a tao. The actualization tendency is realized only under certain conditions. People must be involved in a relationship with a partner who is congruent or authentic and who demonstrates empathy and unconditional positive regard. So Rogers emphasized that having a partner who possesses these three qualities does not cause the people to move toward constructive change, but rather permits them to actualize their innate tendency toward self-fulfillment. Rogers contended that whenever congruence, unconditional positive regard, and empathy are present in a relationship, psychological growth will invariably occur. For this reason, He regarded these three conditions as both necessary and sufficient conditions for becoming a fully functioning or self-actualizing person. Although people share the actualizing tendency with plants and other animals, only humans have a concept of self 
and thus a potential for self-actualization. The Self and Self-Actualization According to Rogers, infants begin to develop a vague concept of self when a portion of their experience becomes personalized and differentiated in awareness as I or me experiences. Infants become aware of their own identity as they learn what tastes good, what tastes bad, what feels pleasant, and what does not. They start to evaluate experiences as positive or negative using a criterion, the actualizing tendency. So nourishment is a requirement for actualization, so they value food and they value hunger. They also value sleep, fresh air, physical contact, and health. Sense of self or personal identity begins to emerge during infancy and once established, it allows a person to strive towards self-actualization. So self-actualization is the desire of the perceived self to reach fulfillment. It is a subset of actualization tendency and is therefore not synonymous with it. It is the tendency to actualize the self as perceived in awareness. While actualization tendency refers to the organismic experiences of individual, that is, it refers to the whole person, conscious and unconscious, physiological and cognitive. It is the organism's tendency to move toward fulfillment. When the organism and the perceived self are in harmony, the two actualization tendencies are nearly identical. But when the people's organism experiences are not in harmony with their view of self, discrepancy exists between the actualization tendency and the self-actualization tendency. For example, if a man's organismic experience is one of anger toward his wife, and if anger toward spouse is contrary to his perception of self, then his actualization tendency and his self-actualization are incongruent and he will experience conflict and inner tension. So Rogers postulated two self-subsystems, the self-concept and ideal self. The self-concept. The self-concept includes all those aspects of one's being and one's experiences that are perceived in awareness, though not accurately by the individual. So, ang self-concept, muna siya ang knowledge sa individual of who he or she is. So, self-concept is not identical with the organismic self or real self. Portions of the organismic self may be beyond a person's awareness or simply not owned by that person. For example, people can disown certain aspects of their selves such as experiences of dishonesty, when such experiences are not consistent with their self-concept. An established self-concept does not make change impossible, but merely difficult. Change most readily occurs in an atmosphere of acceptance by others, which allows a person to reduce anxiety and threat and to take ownership of previously rejected experiences. The ideal self it is defined as one's view of self as one wishes to be. The ideal self contains all those attributes, usually positive, that people aspire to possess. A wide gap between the ideal self and the self-concept indicates incongruence and an unhealthy personality. Awareness The symbolic representation, not necessarily in verbal symbols, of some portion of our experiences. So, without awareness, the self-concept and the ideal self would not exist. There are three levels of awareness. First, some events are experienced below the threshold of awareness and are either ignored or denied. So, ignored. Example, a woman walking down a busy street. So, sa street kay daghan kay mga potential stimuli nga naa. Example, kay sa sight o sa sound, daghan kay pwede makita, tas daghan pwede madungog. Pero di lito niya ma-accommodate na and ma-attend na stimuli, so many of the stimuli remains ignored. Denied. A mother who never wanted children, per out of guilt, kay ka na nag-show siya o concern o care sa iyang mga children. So, iyang resentment towards her children is still there, but it is hidden to her never-reaching consciousness. So, kana gina deny niya nga kanang na she resentment towards her children kay tungod sa guilt nga iyang na feel 
So, nag-show na noon siya o concern of care para sa mga bata. Second level of awareness. Rogers hypothesized that some experiences are accurately symbolized and freely admitted to the self-structure. So, for example, if a pianist who has full confidence in his piano playing ability is told by a friend that his playing is excellent, he may hear these words, accurately symbolize them, and freely admit them to his self-concept. The third level of awareness involves experiences that are perceived in a distorted form. When our experience is not consistent with our view of self, we reshape or distort the experience so that it can be assimilated into our existing self-concept. Denial of positive experiences. Compliments, even those genuinely dispensed, seldom have a positive influence on the self-concept of the recipient. They may be distorted because the person distrusts the giver or they may be denied because the recipient does not feel deserving of them. Becoming a person. Rogers discussed the processes necessary to becoming a person. First, an individual must make contact, positive or negative, with another person. This contact is the minimum experience necessary for becoming a person. So for example, for an infant to survive, they must experience some contact from a parent or other caregiver. As they become aware that another person has a measure of regard for them, they begin to value positive regard and they value negative regard. So what is positive regard? Positive regard is the need to be loved, liked, or accepted by another person. So if we perceive that others care for, prize, or value us, then our need to receive positive regard is at least partially satisfied. Positive regard is the prerequisite for positive self-regard, which defined as the experience of prizing or valuing oneself. So Rogers believed that receiving positive regard from others is necessary for positive self-regard, but once positive self-regard is established, it becomes independent of the continual need to love. The source of positive self-regard then lies in the positive regard we receive from others. But once established, it is autonomous and self-perpetuating. Barriers to Psychological Health Not everyone becomes a psychologically healthy person. Rather, most people experience conditions of worth, incongruence, defensiveness, and disorganization. Conditions of worth They perceive that their parents, peers, or partners love and accept them only if they meet those people's expectations and approval. If we see that others accept us regardless our actions, then we come to believe that we are priced unconditionally. But, if we perceive that some of our behaviors are approved and some are not, then we see that our worth is conditional. Conditions of worth become the criterion by which we accept or reject our experiences. External Evaluations It is defined as our perception of other people's view of us. So these evaluations, whether positive or negative, do not foster psychological health but rather prevent us from being completely open to our own experiences. When our own experiences are distrusted, we distort our awareness of them, thus solidifying the discrepancy between our organismic evaluation and the values we have interjected from others. As a result, we experience incongruence. Incongruence. Psychological disequilibrium begins when we fail to recognize our organismic experiences as self-experiences. This incongruence between our self-concept and our organismic experience is the source of psychological disorders. We do not accurately symbolize organismic experiences into awareness because they appear to be inconsistent with our emerging self-concept. Vulnerability. The greater the incongruence between our perceived self or self-concept and our organismic experience, the more vulnerable we are. Rogers believed that people are vulnerable when they are unaware of the discrepancy between their organismic self and their significant experience. Anxiety and Threat Anxiety and threat are experienced as we gain awareness of the incongruence within ourselves. 
Anxiety is the state of uneasiness or tension whose cause is unknown. Threat, an awareness that ourself is no longer whole or congruent. We feel anxious when we become aware of the difference between our organismic experience and our self-concept. Our anxiety begins to evolve into threat as we become aware of the incongruence between our organismic experience and our perception of self. Defensiveness Defensiveness is the protection of the self-concept against anxiety and threat by the denial or distortion of experiences inconsistent with it. The two chief defenses are distortion and denial. Distortion, we misinterpret an experience in order to fit it into some aspect of our self-concept. Denial, we refuse to perceive an experience in awareness or at least we keep some aspect of it from reaching symbolization. Both distortion and denial serve the same purpose. They keep our perception of our organismic experiences consistent with our self-concept which allows us to ignore or block out experiences consistent that otherwise would cause unpleasant anxiety or threat. Disorganization Why would defenses fail? Denial and distortion are adequate to keep normal people from recognizing this discrepancy. But, when the incongruence between people's perceived self and their organismic experience is either too obvious or occurs too suddenly to be denied or distorted, their behavior becomes disorganized. Most people engage in defensive behavior, but sometimes defenses fail and behavior becomes disorganized or psychotic. In a state of disorganization, people sometimes behave consistently with their organismic experiences and sometimes in accordance with their shattered self-concept.